and we are live here in the Storycraft Cafe. I am your host, Hank Garner. Today, I am so excited to have Meg Cabot on the show with us today. You might know Meg. Uh, you definitely know Meg's work. Uh, if you uh, have been alive in the last couple of decades, <laughs> then you are familiar with The Princess Diaries and a, a whole host of other stories, like 80 stories that that meg has written and published uh today we're here to talk about her brand new book it's called enchanted to meet you and what a fun read this is and especially for this time of year um it was super fun to read and i'm excited to chat with you today welcome to the show meg oh well thanks so much for having me and for talking about enchanted to meet you absolutely um i, I like to start the show meg with a fun question to kind of you know, set the tone and to get things started. And one question that I love to ask people is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, wow. I mean, I always loved reading and I loved writing because um, mainly because my parents, when I would say there's nothing in the house to read and they would say, go to the library and find something. Or they would just hand me a sheet of paper and a pen and be like, write your own story. And for some reason that worked for me. So um, I feel like I always wanted to be a writer, but I didn't know that you could actually do it as a female um, until I saw that movie, Romancing the Stone. It's so embarrassing. But yes, Kathleen Turner and Michael Douglas, that whole movie where she's a romance writer and goes oh, yeah. on this amazing adventure. I didn't care about the adventure. I was so intrigued by how she's sitting there working on her book at the beginning of the movie. And then she finishes it and she gives her cat a little can of tuna fish or something. I was like, oh my God, I want to be her. And that just lasted through the 80s all the way until now. I, I remember going to see that movie with my mom uh, <sighs> in whatever year that came out. We saw it in the yeah. theater. And, and I remember that having... Uh, profound effect on me as well maybe not as indelible an, an effect as, as you have yeah. but I, I do have that memory and uh, there, there were several stories during that time that uh, that involved writers and yeah. and I remember thinking I, I don't I don't remember when it happened but I I remember there being a transformation in my understanding that mm -hmm. up until this time uh, books were just things and then yeah. i realized that people were behind them and <laughs> if people people wrote them and then illustrators you know got involved in some of them and then yeah. publishers and editors and it's it, it's a whole team effort you know behind it oh yeah and once you humanize that the you know the gloves are off it's it it's open to you know, it just opens up the possibilities it's amazing. It was an amazing discovery that I, I was like, I thought all authors were dead, <laughs> but <laughs> there are clearly many of them are alive. So that was very uh, exciting for me. <laughs> nice. Um, do you think your your parents, when they would hand you uh, a piece of paper and say, write your own story, do you, do you think it ever dawned on them that, that they were, you know, feeding no. this this desire? No, they had no idea. And in fact, when I told them that I wanted to be a writer, they were like, no, that's not going to work out for you. You need to get a real job. I mean, and it's good. It's true because it's, it is really yeah. good advice. But I was devastated. But my mom did make me take typing in high school because she was like, I can see that this is a thing you're going to do. However, at least this way you'll be able to get a job as a secretary and then you can write on the side. And that really ended up being what I did, although I was an administrative assistant, not a secretary. But I'm really glad that she did make me take typing and for for the the younger listeners uh today <laughs> typing used to actually be a class that was oh, yeah. I, I remember taking it in high school and it was a year-long class and yeah. and i remember the the feel of those ibm selectrics and the yes. the the vibrating you know that you felt through the keys yeah. it, it was a whole experience yeah yeah i loved it i have to say but i was a weirdo who wanted to be a writer so it was great for me <laughs> So you worked as an administrative assistant. Um, what was it that um, that intrigued you enough to start writing that first novel? You know, I just, well, going back to Romance in the Stone, I was yeah. realizing, wow, okay, so a lot of romance novels are published every year. It's a billion-dollar industry, and if sure. I'm going to break in, 
this is probably a good genre for me to break into. And I loved romance. I was always reading them in the library because they're filled with empowering women who find happiness at the end, yeah. always, hopefully. And um, I, I thought, I want to put stuff out that's like that. And so I bought a bunch of those books on how to write a romance novel. And I was following all the rules and I just kept writing them. And I mean, I think I wrote my first one probably in high school. And then I just kept writing them. And it was just a matter of trying to find somebody who wanted to publish them. <laughs> that, was, just, that was the hard part. <laughs> right, right. When, when you just said that, you you uh, triggered a memory that uh, of something that I read on your YouTube channel. Um, and under the About section, you said, I write books for you, your sister, your best friend, your mother, dot, 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 even for men with good taste. Um, <laughs> as... As someone who um, primarily fits under the romance, uh, kind of big umbrella romance, um, and then, you know, that you filter out into all sorts of sub genres there. What do you think about men and, and romance? Because I have a very um, specific feeling about it. But but how do you feel oh. about men reading romance and and men that might read your books kind of on the sly? I think it's really good. I think more men should read romance because then they know what women want and what we're all kind of hoping for and our dreams. And, you know, they're not all just to get married and have kids. We want to have careers. We want to be fulfilled completely as a human being. And often that includes having a partner that you can share that life with. So, um, you know, I, I always have a little tender spot in my heart for guys when I find out that they're reading, you know, football players or um, politicians who are on the sly reading romance novels. And I wish that they didn't have to do it on the sly. They should just be open about it because they're great books about family and finding yourself. And, um, you know, those are the most important things I think in the world. Well, in every genre uh, that, that we read, um, I, I can't think of one that, uh, that doesn't get reviews like, um, you know, th this has the the most well thought out characters and the most realistic characters. And by contrast, we've all read stories where the the characters are one dimensional cardboard, you know, just, you know, flat. And and one thing that that all humans that I've ever met in human experience uh, long for is is love and, and romance yeah. and connection of a lifelong partner. Uh, and so it doesn't matter if you're writing fantasy or science fiction or right. political thrillers or rom-coms, um, you kind of ought to understand how this element of storytelling works. So no matter what yeah. you're writing, I recommend people read romance all the time, because if you want well thought out characters, well described characters, isn't this something that, that every character should, you know, ha have a, uh, a, a moment that, that this, yeah. you know, is a want that, that should be described. I, I think so. That's just my personal soapbox. Thank you. And I agree. And I do enjoy in my spare time now when I have a moment to read, I like to read mysteries, but I always want there to be a romance in the mystery. So they, right. they solve the crime, but then they also ha find happiness together. Those are my favorite kind of mysteries. Yeah. Um, Meg, do I understand right that you wrote your first book under a pen name? I did. I wrote, um, I think, eight. Um when I first started out, they were historical romance novels. I, my dream finally came true and I got my romance novels published, but I wrote them under a pen name because I didn't want my grandma to find out because they were a little bit scandalous. And they were a little um, spicy. I thought, yeah, they were a little spicy, but she um, actually did find out and she was totally fine with it. She loved them and was my biggest fan. So it turned out I didn't, I didn't need to do that, but yeah. So how many did you publish un under the historical I romance? Uh, Patricia Cabot. Yes. So they're out of print now, but I think you can get them as eBooks. Um, Pat uh, I think I have eight. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, okay, so um, did you, did you write and publish all of them before Princess Mia came along? Yeah. I started writing, um, the Princess Diaries kind of while I actually had a romance novel too. And I was still working my job as the, as the administrative assistant at, at NYU. And, um, I just started writing a book about a girl who her mother's dating one of her teachers. Cause that was happening to me. It was very upsetting. My dad had passed away and my mom started dating, which was fine. But then it turned out she was dating someone that had been my teacher and it was so gross to me. Um, but the fact that, 
their both they had lost their spouses and they were finding love together later in life i i was actually happy for them but i was grossed out because <laughs> I even, my teacher when i went home for christmas making out with my mom it was to this day yeah, that's, very uncomfortable. that makes that makes christmas a little awkward doesn't it yes absolutely yeah. so so that was the catalyst for the princess diaries was this oh yeah and That's everybody hilarious. thinks it's about a girl who t- finds out she's a princess. But to me, that whole series is about a girl processing the trauma of seeing her mom with her algebra teacher. And she's just like, ah, how could this be happening to me? And I originally in the first draft, she, the princess was 30 years old. She was my age. And so people would read it and they'd say, why, why is this girl so immature? And I'm like, wait, I'm immature? It's, it's about me. So I had to change it up. I made her in high school and um, I added the whole princess thing because there was no plot except that yeah. she, hates, she hates seeing her teacher <laughs> making out with her mom. That was basically the whole story. So I had to throw in a little more. That is so funny. So so you had written and published um, eight novels mm-hmm. and were working on The Prince's Diaries yeah. and still working a day job? Yeah, I mean, you don't get paid a lot in publishing, especially when you're just starting out. So people who have, I mean, there are occasionally you hear about authors who get this multi-million dollar deal, but mine was a few thousand, plus half of that goes to taxes, and then you have to give 15% to your agent. So it was just enough money to kind of, you know, help out with some rent, and in New York City, that was, that didn't go very far. But I loved it so much, I kept doing it. Did, um, and... And this is a hypothetical because your life did change when the Princess Diaries came out. So maybe it's an unfair question. Um, but do you could you see yourself continuing this even as a side hobby or, you know, a side business, if you will, um, even if you had to continue working a day job, would would okay. writing have have stayed in the same kind of esteem with you? Yeah. And that's actually one of the things that I told myself when I kept getting rejected in the beginning when I was sending stuff out and all I was getting was rejections. Um, and my husband was the one who said to me, you know, you love doing this. It's clearly your favorite thing to do. If people just keep telling you that they can't publish it, are you going to quit? He, and he used an example of himself because he loves to play golf. And he's like, I love golf, but I'm never going to be a pro, but I'm not going to stop playing it just because I'm not a pro. And then he said, um, you know, I'm no Tiger Woods. And I was like, oh, you know what? <laughs> Later on, I was very appreciative. That he's no t- <laughs> that's so mean to Tiger. But anyway, yes, I just was like, I would keep doing this. Um, I don't want my publishers to know that I would still do it for free, but I would. Because it's how I think I, tra- I process trauma, clearly. So yeah, Right. Well, um. It- the fantasy author Brandon Sanderson told me one time that he had written 13 big doorstop novels before he was ever published. Yeah. And, and he said, um, he said, it's so weird that we put um, all of this pressure on novelists. If you tell someone I'm writing a novel, you know, they're like, well, when, when is it going to yeah. be in the bookstore? You know? And he said, people go to the Y and play basketball you know, every week with their friends and we don't ask them, you know, when's the NBA coming by to pick you up, you know, that's so true. Yeah. It's this weird thing that that we put Mm -hmm. on some hobbies and not others, but you know, yeah. And that's why at a certain point I I stopped telling anyone that that was my goal that I wanted to be published because people were asking, when's your book coming out? And all I was getting was rejection. So I just kept it to myself. I didn't tell anyone except my husband knew. Um, And then when I finally did get published, I was like, ha ha, see suckers and then of course they read them and they're like no this isn't for me but some of them really liked them so that was good yeah and thank god for that day job that that gave you the freedom to pursue that you know i I think we we put you know too much pressure on that sometimes you know thank god that 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 allowed you to be able to do that you know or absolutely i mean i talking today Exactly. And I had benefits. And one of the benefits since it was a job at a university was that I could take classes for free. So I was taking oh, nice. writing classes. And it was just a really great experience. And I really didn't want to quit. But then I got too many book contracts. So I didn't have time for the day <laughs> job anymore. So um, that worked out. And I was so glad my mom made me take typing because I got that job based on my typing skills. Nice. Nice. Yeah. So you, you finished the princess diaries. And if I remember the story, right, you shopped it around and got rejected from just about everybody. Is that right? Yeah. My agent, um, I had an agent for the romances and she was like, I'm going to try to sell this. 
Um, but one of the places she sent it to first was out to um, a agent in Hollywood who was like, this would be great for a movie. So he started shopping it in um, those kind of circles. And so it actually got option to be a movie before I found a publisher because it was being rejected oh, wow. everywhere in New York. But in California, they liked it. <laughs> it was very How funny. funny. How funny. Um, you you start writing historical fiction, then you write this, uh, the, the Princess Diaries, which is um, young adult. Um, is that how you would classify the, the first oh, yeah. novel? Yeah. Yeah. So what, how did that feel kind of shifting your entire focus and your target audience? Did, was that ever, um, you know, a worry that, you know, I've, you know, I've got eight books over here. I've kind of established at least in the genre now switching up. It, was that a difficult thing? Because you've kind of made that's kind of one of your hallmarks of your career is that you'll do this thing and then you'll shift gears and do something kind of completely different. And then people love that too. So oh. does that kind of become, you know, this, you never know what to expect, you know, from Meg, but it's going to be great. <laughs> you know, what? how do you feel about uh, switching you. genres and, and, and having readers that will follow you into these oh, different that's... categories? Thank you. Um, you know, I didn't know. I, I have to admit, I had no idea what I was doing when I first wrote The Prince. I didn't even know what YA was. And my agent was the one who said, this is YA. And I didn't, until I actually walked into my first book signing as Meg Cabot, the author of The Princess Diaries, and I saw yeah. how young the readers were. They were so little. They had like braces. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, what have I done? Like these are, I can't swear, <laughs> you know, at this signing, because these are little kids who were all dressed as princesses. And it was so sweet. But um, it was it was a shock because I was used to just talking to adults like on, on this level. And then all of a sudden you're talking to very young girls especially and um you have to be really careful what you say and what you do and right. so that was more of a shock than switching back and forth between genres which and categories which i actually like to do because i think i would get bored otherwise if i wasn't doing a little something for adults and a little something for kids and a mystery here a paranormal there it keeps me on my toes yeah having a, a book that becomes a movie or maybe having a movie that became books and since, you know, uh, it was kind of shopped that way first that you got the attention of Hollywood really before you got the attention of the publishing world, at least yeah. for that book. Um, how does that change your life as a writer? Uh, I, I would imagine that your books exploded after that. But how does that uh, I guess what I really want to know is how does that change your attitude as a writer, your expectations and what people um, expect from you and how you follow up a success like that is is there all kind of new pressure that that comes with um, paychecks um I didn't really feel that you know I, this all happened in the days before the internet so there wasn't right. social media and there wasn't so much like people didn't know who I was which was great and I didn't I wasn't looking up reviews of myself and I didn't you know Amazon had just started um, so I think I've in that way, I was really lucky because I didn't have to obsess about what was happening. And I still try not to like I try I don't have social media on my phone. And I just try to um, avoid all that because it does put so much pressure on you. And it was it was a very different time, though, back when I started. Gotcha. Um, this was also pre 9-11, um, which yeah. kind of is another world changing. You've got the Internet and you've got 9-11 that kind of these seismic shifts in in uh you know our uh collective consciousness um the princess diaries i, I think the first two books were out before 9 11 is that right yeah. um yes. was there a was there a change in um readership and you know the the way people kind of thought about the world or were your books kind of the safe haven in even in the midst of kind of the craziness of the world that's how I tried to make them because I felt like I was looking for comfort reads at that time. And so I thought this is something I can provide for people if they need that. And that's always kind of my thought when I'm writing something is if I'm reading this during, if I'm a reader and I'm reading this like at the, in the hospital waiting room while I'm waiting for a terrible diagnosis of a relative I love or something, um, I want to keep the book fun, you know, still interesting, but you know, maybe not a, 
mention, obviously, because <laughs> that was right. definitely a traumatic experience for a lot of people, including yeah. my husband who was there that day. So that was just, um, it was a bad time. And I, actually after 9-11, my writing uh, changed a lot in that I couldn't write at a desk anymore because in my apartment, my desk, my back was to the windows and I lived high up. So I was scared that a plane was going to come into my window. So I started writing in bed where I could face the windows. And I've been doing that ever since. It was, it was a weird time. Wow. Wow. That, yeah, I never thought about the kind yeah. of that level of fallout, but it, it completely changed your whole process, huh? Oh yeah. I've never, I've never written at a desk since. Wow. Jeez. Um, <laughs> that's dark. I'm sorry. Let's talk about more no, serial I'm, things. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just processing all that. Is, that is wild. Um, you, when the, the princess diaries, you know, obviously were this phenomenal success. And then, uh, you, how many books have you written in that series now? And, and, and I know that princess Mia has, has aged and, you know, gone through all of these life changes and, um, that had to be fun to, follow her along and, and age her appropriately. Yeah, it was. And that was always my plan. When I first wrote the book, I wanted to follow this girl all the way through high school. So I had planned about 16 books and that's how many there are. There's about 16. Um, aside uh, from, from the princess diaries, I, you've written something like 20 something different series um, I, 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 I was trying to count and I just, I said, uh, I'll lot. just ask her. Uh, it's a lot. Um, yeah. when, um, were you writing the princess diaries and had another brilliant idea and said, yeah, I want to uh. go chase this for a while. Like, how do you take something that's so successful and branch out and kind of start all over with new characters, new settings and, um, is, is that exciting to you? Is it a little scary? Um, how do you kind of make those decisions about what to follow up next? And, you know, will I have a readership for it? Right. Yeah, no, it's hard. And, um, some of the publishers put clauses in your contract that you can't write other books under, you know, your own name while you're doing this particular series for them. So there, for a while I was also writing under a different pen name called Jenny Carroll, um, I was writing oh, Paranormal wow. YA. Yeah, so um, the Mediator series, and I think the 1-800-Where-Are-You series, I was writing for a different publisher under a different name because I was competing against myself in a way. Um, so that went on for a while, but they proved to be popular enough that my previous publisher, who had actually turned them down at first, was like, no, we like the Princess series. We don't want to get into this paranormal stuff. They agreed that they would take those on, and so they were republished under my, my real name. But it was tough. I mean, I was writing a lot under all these different names. I was still doing the historical romances to a certain extent. So, um, yeah, I had three websites. <laughs> <laughs> it was so hard. I still own, I think, Jerry, JennyCarroll.com, which I feel bad for, like, the real Jenny Carrolls out there. Because <laughs> I have their name. But I will never let it go, just in case. <laughs> well, speaking of the paranormal, because uh, Enchanted to Meet You is, is a bit of a paranormal. I, I think that's safe to say. Um, what was your, your initial fascination with, with paranormal romance? What, what was it about the, the genre as a whole that, that excited you? Um, you know, the witch thing in particular, I've written about witches before in a previous book called Jinx, um, but that was for teenagers. And now I feel like there's a kind of resurgence and a interest in and love for witches. And I feel like it really is rooted into the fact that a lot of women's rights are being kind of, uh, I don't want to say persecuted, but we we definitely are losing our rights. And that's something that primarily, historically, witches have been female and were basically executed for really strange reasons. It was not obviously because they were practicing witchcraft, but that's what people said. And yeah. so I got really interested in exploring that uh, as a kind of modern take today and in my research, I found out that there's still people in other countries who are being executed for witchcraft. So, you know, it was a dark, dark reason that I started writing about it. But it is, I think, a fun contemporary take on if you were just a regular person who started practicing witchcraft, what would happen? So when you um, uh, when you have the idea for a new book or a new series, Kind of, what's the the what if game that starts playing out in your mind? It, you know, did, does it come with? Uh, is it initially a character that kind of walks onto the stage of your mind, and you're like, 
well, who are you and what are you up to? And um, or is it uh, maybe a plot scenario? Um, you know, kind of what would happen if this happened? And then you start casting that scenario in your mind. Kind of what is, what's that moment of creation like with a new book or new series? I do always start with, um, like you said, a scenario, a plot. Um, and so for the Enchanted to Meet You, I, it was a chosen one kind of trope. Like what would happen if this woman had been kind of just a low key witch in her town and all of a sudden somebody walked into her place of work and told her, hey, you know what? You are the chosen one. If you don't help us, this whole town is going to be destroyed in an apocalyptic supernatural <laughs> event. And um, which I'm, I'm just going to say is probably something I fantasized about happening when I was working my day job. <laughs> I was like, oh, if only somebody would walk in and tell me that I have to save the universe. That never happened. Um, but it's fun to write about it happening to somebody else. So that was really the um, process of writing that book. And, and pretty much all my books have been that way. So tell me about the the character of Jessica Gold. Um, you, she was a chosen one. Uh, kind of what what was the process of, of of building this character? Like like who is she to you, and what was it that, um, you know, that kind of grabbed your attention and and let you know that she would be special? I like the idea of um, people who still live in their small town where they grew up um, because they're constantly running into people that, that maybe were mean to them in high school. And so that's <laughs> the idea for Jessica is that she's still living in her same small town, but she's a businesswoman. She owns a beautiful little uh, boutique clothing store and her kind of supernatural power is that she can pick out clothes for anyone and make them look great and feel great and give them confidence, which I wish is a superpower that I had, but um, I do not. And I thought it would be great to then write about all the stresses in her life, which number one is her high school nemesis who is really mad at her. And the fact that when she was young, she cast a spell, a love spell without consent on a guy in high school. And uh, of course later has to pay the price for doing that because you can't cast a spell on someone without their consent. Um, so that was, I think really how I crafted this character that she, you know, she's plus size and she's full of confidence, but she has a few, a few problems that keep coming back to plague her. And it's all because of her past. And it's all because she still lives in this same small town. Well, the, the small town element um, is so much fun because um, I live in a small town and I, you know, that the, the pluses of living in a small town is everyone knows each other and, yeah. you know, you know, you know, each other's family and there's a real tight knit community, but you know, the downside of that is, you know, small towns can be kind of cliquish and, uh, and, and, uh, you know, she is not, um, she's the chosen one, but not necessarily chosen by the the power elites you know in the small town and that's that's a fun um kind of juxtaposition of being chosen but kind of still being a little bit of an outcast amongst your your you know where you are and um yeah. that that's a fun thing to play with isn't it yeah i really like the idea that um you know amongst witches there's a kind of prejudice in this scenario where um there's a group of people who think you have to be descended from a witch in order to be a true witch mm -hmm. and then there's jessica and her friends who are like well i think you could just let's just see what happens and kind of try to manifest positive energy <laughs> and it works and so that disproves the whole theory that you especially in new england where there's so many people who've been descended from witches um it kind of made a lot of people mad at her right well, and you couldn't have a, a, a rom-com uh, if there wasn't a love interest. So tell me about Derek and wh where does he come in and how did you develop him? Derek is a guy who shows up at Jessica's clothing boutique and tells her she's the chosen one. He has all this information that he's not really willing to share because, you know, she can't know too much. Um, but yeah, he has some magical stuff going on as well, which uh, Jessica finds out slowly over time. And it was... I really wanted to craft a hero who could stand up to Jessica's snarkiness and confidence and fun. Um, you know, cause it was a kind of love interest she was not finding in her small town because as she mentions, you know, if you put on your Tinder profile also <laughs> does witchcraft, you just get some really weird. <laughs> I'm imagining, I don't know. Cause I haven't done right, that, but right. that's what I perceive in this small town. 
So um, he's definitely somebody that she's very interested in romantically. But, um, you know, he just blew into town to tell her, hey, your uh, your town's going to be destroyed. So <laughs> you right. better get get going on saving it. You said that from the beginning you were kind of playing with this trope, with the the chosen one trope. Um, do you, when you start working on a book, um, are you? Well, first off, are you a, a a planner or a pantser? You know, we we love in the writing community to put people in one or two. You know, one of these camps. Uh, you know, do you plan the book out before you start writing, or do you write by the seat of your pants? I would love to be a planner, but I'm not. I'm a. I'm definitely a pantser, and it just kind of. I don't know how it works. I usually do plan. I know the ending and I know the beginning and I just don't know what's going to happen in the middle. But I always say, especially when I'm talking to younger writers, that that's kind of like planning a trip. You buy your tickets, you know where you're going. Right. You don't know everything that's going to happen while you're on this trip. And that's the fun part. That's what makes the trip worth it. Yeah. Do you, do you have, a, you know, with 80 some odd books, have you developed a system of, uh, you know, taking notes or kind of tracking ideas as they come? And do you have a, a system that you work through? That's great. A system. No, <laughs> I do not. I wish I did. I, the only thing that I have um, is, a, is story bibles. Oh, I'm sorry, story bibles for each of the series. So I re can refer to that um, to try to remember okay who is so and so related to whether the names right. of their brothers and how what color are their eyes i do get into some trouble sometimes when i forget uh what somebody looks like in my different series so i have to go back thank goodness i have actually the publishers have made some of the story bibles for me because there have been so many disasters <laughs> where there was like <laughs> continuity issues they're like here this is what it is everybody looks like and who they're related to don't forget Probably saves a lot of money on editing. If you, just... you know, yeah, they had to go back and yeah, <laughs> right. do a second printing for something that outraged a lot of readers, which is fine. It was just somebody's eye color that switched between books. Right. Um, when you start working on a story, do you have an idea about whether this is going to launch a new series or if this will be a standalone um uh, do you do you think about series potential or do you even think in those terms? I do. I mean, I definitely do for some books, like obviously the Princess Diaries and the Mediator series. I knew those were going to be series. Like I had them kind of planned out some things that were going to happen. Um, but other books, no, I don't I don't have any idea. And it, this book started out just as a standalone. And um, the more I wrote it and was having fun kind of in the town of West Harbor, Connecticut, uh, I thought, oh, you know, more stuff could happen. <laughs> to these people and maybe some other people and that would be really fun to do so i i said Let, can we make it a series and my editor said yes and now i regret it deeply because i have so many books to no i'm kidding <laughs> i'm so excited <laughs> i've got a deadline right now that i'm never gonna meet do, do you find yourself um staying within the world of a series until that is exhausted or do you write one book in this series and then have another idea and go write that for a while and come back and back and forth. How do you juggle all of these different worlds and characters that you've created? Yeah, I, I bounce back and forth. Um, I have another children's series that I'm working on right now. Um, and book two of that one is due as well. <laughs> so <laughs> it's fun for me. I, that's my idea of fun. And it's, Thankfully, I have these story Bibles to keep them all straight in my head. So, but it's really nice to be able to visit with some people, and then the next yeah. week you visit with other people, and that's just kind of how I like to work. It helps to stay fresh too, doesn't it? That when yeah. you, when you're kind of stuck over here, you've got another place to go to, and exactly. And I get really the hard part is then not thinking of some other new book that you want to start working on instead and <laughs> then you're off in like a third thing which it just happened to me recently which is why I'm late on these two other books so yeah that's and I always say to people you know try to finish what you're working on before you start on this next idea but I never follow that advice <laughs> I mean it's good advice I wish I could follow it yeah do, do you have a daily writing uh habit do, do you give yourself a, 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 a certain uh, goal each day that, that you try to meet or you know, does it, yeah. uh, does, does the whim just have to hit you? No, there's no whims. No muse. It's all just <laughs> sitting your 
but in the bed for me. Um, but I do have a writing friend who, who's also a writer and we all have deadlines. And so we have a thing that we call five by five. So we have to write five pages a day by five o'clock or we have to donate five dollars to our most hated politician. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to say it's Trump. It right now it's it's but it's changed over the years. But um, I'm sorry if that alienates anyone. But yeah, we just don't want to have to donate money to politicians that we don't like, and it really works. You get those five pages done by five, even if it's just like you know you deleted five pages of yesterday's and wrote it over. That counts. It all counts. That's hilarious. That's hilarious. Well. Enchanted to Meet You is available everywhere now. Go visit your local bookstore. Pick up a copy of it. If you don't have a great local bookstore near you, we'll put links to it in the show notes where you can grab it from Amazon. Um, Meg, is uh, is the audiobook of this available? Yeah. Yes, and it's got a really great – it's actually a female – you know, an actress and an actor. So we've got both oh, nice. perspectives, which is really um, unusual from one of my audiobooks. Awesome. Awesome. Um, we'll include links there where you can grab it from Audible as well. Um, have you have you listened to it yet or listened no. to any of the samples? No. I, yeah, I can't listen to my own. It was, <laughs> I have to say, it's terrible. Like, I actually went to the audio, to the studio when Anne Hathaway read the first three Princess Diaries. So I went there to see her and hearing my own writing being read by somebody else i'm always like oh it's so terrible let me just fix it let me it'll be easier for you right. to say if i fix it and of course the publisher's like no you can't change it from what's actually already been published it's got to stay the same so it's really hard for me to listen because i just i feel like an artist who's gone to the museum and seen their own painting and they're like oh let me just change this one little part of the painting they don't let you so it's too hard for me that's that's hilarious well go grab the always editing from... right right um, Meg, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're going to send everyone to pick up a copy of the new book. Um, if people are just discovering you or, you know, making the connections that, um, you know, that you are who, who you are, um, is there a place online that's a, a good place to send new people to kind of dig yeah. into your back catalog and everything going on with you? Oh, yeah. Thank you for asking that. Um, yes, go to MegCabot.com. And really right on the main page, there's a little quiz that you can take. Like, what are you interested okay. in reading it? And it will take you to um, all the different books that I've written and whatever you're actually interested in reading. Excellent. There's going to be something. We'll, we'll link that up in the show notes as well. Uh, Meg, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Oh, thank you. This was really nice and fun. <laughs> <laughs> 